good afternoon to everyone which joined. Uh, I am Bernard Able, as Sarah said. I host the City Breakfast Show and the Point of View on City TV. I'm also the general manager of the business. I think the first two speakers are on point. There's a lot of issue with the policy environment, which affects ownership, which affects content, and then which affects usage. But even in that cloud, there's a silver lining. Because I think Ghana is much better than a lot of our peers in many ways. Um, I will just make a few quick comments around our own experience. So as a radio and TV station, we depend on technology to reach our audiences. And we are noticing that they are reaching us in multiple ways. So yes, people will listen to the radio via a normal transistor, but a lot more are listening via online streaming. For television as well, people are watching on normal free-to-air digital TV. Some are also consuming on an app, and some are watching on YouTube and other social media platforms like Facebook. So there are multiple channels of reaching our audiences. So yes, the policy generally tends to follow a political clientelism format where particularly radio and TV licenses are given on the basis of who's in power, who's your friend. But because the technology itself of broadcasting is changing so rapidly, people are finding new ways of getting the content. So that's the first angle I'll bring. Second issue has to do with, as a media house, our own content includes a lot of technology. So for example, we have a partnership with MasterCard Foundation and the Meltwater Entrepreneurial School of Technology once a month, we do something called EdTech Monday, where we discuss how technology can be used to enhance education at various levels. We finish one season, we're on another season. These are very important platforms to drive knowledge and understanding about what technology can do, and also to understand the challenges of using technology, because on those platforms, we are bringing panelists from all over using Google or Hangout or whatever uh, platform. We've also created a number of platforms that discuss technology usage, like Philip Ashon City Trends, like a, a, an educational series called Class Act. All of these are giving people the chance to interact with our content and also to understand the role of technology, particularly in education. I am happy to share more examples of how the platforms we have help our audiences use technology. Final thing I'll say is that we see a lot of promise in EdTech in particular, because in our programs, we've seen people create solutions for education, which even work offline. So these tools are available to schools that they can use to deliver lectures even during COVID-19, where they don't have any internet connection. At the base of all of this, we need accessible and affordable internet. And I'm sure we can discuss that later on. So in a nutshell, even though some of the policy direction is incongruent, I think the multiplicity of channels and the ingenuity of Ghanaians creates a lot of interesting possibilities we can talk about as the program proceeds. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Um, that's a, a decidedly more optimistic tone <laughs> than much of what we've been discussing today, but, and, and that's great. Um, uh, I think maybe I'll go to um, Alex to uh, contribute what uh, the, uh, I, I, you know, Haptel's uh, sector of the economy, uh, sorry, there's a, there's a bit of an echo here, so I'm trying to, to not be distracted by it. Um, but if we can bring in Alex to, to tell us a little bit about what your company is doing um, in terms of adding to this multiplicity of channels, right? So on the one hand, we have media and uh, ICT sort of intersecting to provide audiences an alternate way to contribute to national discussions, um, but to also get around some of the restrictions brought on by, by sort of government policies. Um, and I know that the tech industry faces a lot of challenges. Uh, Masha talked about the role that the state plays, but again, the market also plays a role. So if Alex can give us a, a, a quick overview of what 
um, how things are shaking out in your sector of the economy. And then we'll come to Atu and Sela, who will talk about, among other things, I hope, you know, advocacy, activism, art, all of the different areas that you're in. Because again, this is the multiplicity of channels we're talking about um, to intervene in the media space. So Alex, over to you. Alex? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you're loud and clear. Yeah, so I, I, I struggled to hear your you a little bit. Can you just recall it? Yes, um, so I just wanted you to uh, tell us a little bit about, I guess, Haptel's uh, position uh, in the tech sector and, and what that sort of contributes to this multiplicity of channels that Bernard and, and Wisdom and others have, have talked about. Um, FinTech uh, plays a significant role in the Ghanaian economy, and so we just want to um, hear a little bit about the innovations in that space and, and what that contributes um, to the, the discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, just a bit about uh, Haptel. So, we've been around since 2005 exploring different kinds of technologies that bring people uh, and businesses together. Um, in 2005, th that technology was SMS because internet uh, was not very popular at, at the time. Uh, we utilize internet technologies to solve so many problems. Um, uh, from banking to how people access content, uh, how people accessed information uh, that was, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, sitting uh, remotely on, on other systems. Uh, so we pioneered services like transactional banking, which has today become so popular. Uh, that technology uh, got the telcos to start looking into mobile money. Uh, we pioneered uh, 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 content services uh, that help farmers access uh, data over SMS, help new mothers access information about how to care for their babies, uh, help a lot of people just with a message to a short code, access all sorts of information. Uh, we translated that into um, other areas uh, and when the internet and mobile money became popular, uh, uh, you saw that Haptel quickly transitioned or we, we pivoted into uh, uh, into the e-commerce or what we call the quick commerce space and also into, into payment. Um, where I see Ghana is, hello, can you hear me? Um, we'll need you to project a little bit more just so the room can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Where, where, I, um, where I see Ghana um, uh, in terms of ICT uh, from Haptel's experiences, I think that Ghana has been very receptive to technology. We're among the first mobile, uh, we're among the first countries in the world or in, in, in Africa uh, specifically. Uh, to adopt mobile technology. When we had uh, uh, mobile phones, uh, for telephony in 1992, many African countries didn't even have a policy uh, for that. Uh, and so I think that's something that we, we, can, we can celebrate. I think we also didn't leave that off. We're among the first countries to see internet spread quickly. We're among the top internet economies on, on the continent. The internet economy, I must say, though, is still very, very small on the continent compared to its contribution to uh, other parts of the world. If you look at what's happening in the developing and the developed countries, um, internet, the contribution of internet companies is so huge in, in, in the economy. And out here, we do not see it at, at playing at, at the same level. It tells you there's a bit of catching up despite our positive history. There's a bit of uh, catching up that uh, all of us will have to do. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, I, I don't want to lay the blame only on, the, on government. I'll put it on uh, the, the, the structures that we need uh, to put in place are, are somewhat missing. Um, Haptel employs about 200 or so uh, people um, 
directly. Many of these people that we employ, for example, come from uh, fresh from uh, from university. And if you talk to the average software engineer, many of them are, are self are self taught uh, how to write program and code and and uh, set up systems. And I don't think that is good enough uh, for something that can generate so much uh, in terms of our economic development to be left to. Uh, to people that are just treating it as a hobby. Uh, I think the school should get involved and start training um, uh, uh, software engineers, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in a more professional way uh, or in a more academic way. Uh, there are also other areas that um, software also creates, things like product managers, things like technical writers, uh, things like uh, Scrum Masters, uh, things like um, uh, uh, the, the, the general support staff, the, the general quasi-technical social support staff that, uh, 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 that, um, that supports the whole business of technology. A lot of these are missing in, uh, in, in, in our country. And I think it's about time we started looking at that towards developing uh, ICT skills. Mm. Uh, the other that also, uh, yeah, so I, I was going to give an opportunity to to Selina to who are on stage with us to respond a, a little bit to that, right? Because you've raised a, a, a critical question, which uh, it also speaks to one of the challenges Masha was was raising, right? Again, we we see potentialities in ICT, and uh, you know whether it's through companies and media adopting companies such as Alex your own or or city FM or, or other spaces um, but again there's a there's a sort of a, a challenge and a barrier to entry that you've highlighted right now um, in the sense that there isn't a sort of unified stem policy that aims to bring about people who might be ready for what we've been calling the fourth industrial revolution right which is essentially what you are sort of alluding to in preparing Ghana at this uh, critical stage for the future so um, I'll let Atu and, and Sela sort of join the conversation as well um, just you know in response to the, the issues that have been raised um, from your perspective thank you all right, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, my name is Sela Ajay. I'm with the multimedia department at uh, NAFTI, but I'm here as a representative for AI for Africa. So AI for Africa is an international consortium of architects, um, medical doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, app developers, and people um, generally within the tech space and we also have um, scholars coming from diverse disciplines and someone might ask why do you need um, scholars from several disciplines to um, speak to issues in tech spaces which speaks to some of the problems that are arising in this discussion and i'll uh, want to pick up pick up from where janet left um, outlining the findings from her research about the gender gap and the inequality in uh, ICT education. And these are some of the things that um, the professionals at AI for Africa um, look at, because we have uh, people who um, deal with tech issues from the gender aspect. We have people who are also speaking to issues from um, the perspective of mental health and then also psychology because um, when we are talking about some of these um, um, technologies and the apps we we tend to look at the potential pitfalls of um, some of the algorithms that um, magnify the inequalities that we are already experiencing in our physical world so um, for instance when um, you go on google you find a lot of bias algorithms for instance when you type um, ceo in the search engine you only find male ceos and this was a problem that was not fixed until recently and um, there are so many other problems that um, we look at, for instance, um, in terms of safety in cyberspace, right? So we have um, a lot of issue with um, surveillance um, corporations that 
have systems and algorithms built in to um, profile more black people as criminals than white people. And we have technologies that uh, work with haptic feedback that does not recognize uh, the touch of black people. So these are some of the things we look at and um, the philosophers within the AI for Africa group talk about the ethics and the morality um, that has to be an integral part of AI. So generally, we offer consultancy services um, to address some of these problems. And then we also have, um, we host webinars, international conferences, and uh, public lectures to discuss some of these issues because it's, it's a reality that we have to deal with. If you, you, we, we, we talk about um, artificial intelligence eventually re replacing what uh, humans were already doing, then it's important that we, we are able to curb some of these problems so that the inequalities that we are facing as a people, the oppressive systems are not migrated into the artificial intelligence platforms. And, uh, recently, there's been talks about um, people being raped, their avatars being raped on the metaverse, which means that a lot of um, measures need to be put in place to create more cyber security, more security within the technological spaces. So these are some of the things that we think around. And we also use our uh, organization as a platform to recruit talents in uh, emerging technologies, people who are making impact in creating safer spaces, people who are making impact in bridging the diversity gap, to, in bridging the gap of inequality to create more sustainable AI. So these are some of the things that um, we generally focus on in AI for Africa. And people from several disciplines bring you know, their intellectual output to create lasting solutions and sustainable um, AI for our tech spaces. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what you, you, you've done is put us at really these crossroads, right? So Alex started talking about the future, and you, you really fully brought us into what um, the future portends with, with artificial intelligence, right? Um, this is the path that we, you know, for better or for worse, that the global tech uh, industry is on. Um, and so um, you, you've also brought, you've highlighted the same, similar challenges, right? That um, fundamentally, technology amplifies whatever the underlying social structure is, right? So if the social structure is violent, what technology will do is amplify that, right? If it's, if it's equitable, if it's inclusive, that's what will happen. So often when, when we have conversations about technology, I think a lot of times people focus on what can technology do? How can technology fix this? And uh, for those of us who are critical scholars of technology, our response is always that, you know, the fundamental change needs to happen with a society that is using the technology because that informs the ethics, that informs the development, that informs the future that you, you imagine, right? So I appreciate you bringing that perspective in. Um, so uh, Atul over there has been active in Ghanathan for a few years now. Ghanathan has been doing uh, a lot of fascinating work, but for me, the thing that really draws my attention is that, for, that initiative of the, my, my dream for Ghana, the future that you have. And I like that we sort of moved our way towards looking forward. So I'd like to for you to share with us what some of the young people that you've been working with have been imagining for, for Ghana. What is this future and what does what role does tech play in it, right? We're we're at some crossroads, we're always at a crossroad. Um, but we're looking towards the future. So what is this future Ghana that Ghana thinks young people have been have been sort of trying to communicate um, at the so thank you so much. Um, I wanted to say a few things to respond to things that you mentioned and I'll go through. Sure, sure. I'll go very quickly. So Ghana Think is a social enterprise into youth uh, empowerment, in the youth empowerment space. And we also like to say that we are in the information sharing business. So um, we we like to see more young people take responsibility for their own personal development. We don't want people to, we want to hear young people say that I don't have a job, it's government's fault. My business is not working, it's government's fault. We know there are many policies and many things that government does that does not augur well for our development, but we are coming from a space of we are going to rise above that, we're, going to, we're not going to complain, we're going to get things done. 
So we reach a lot of people through um, many channels. So we have events like bar camps and connect uh, meetups, uh, where there's a lot of networking and mentoring where we share information. We use Twitter a lot. Um, most of the bar camps that we organize in Ghana normally trend on Twitter. We also you know, package information for Facebook, package information for Instagram, and also package information for YouTube. And since COVID, we have started to do a lot on WhatsApp. Because WhatsApp is a very engaging platform in Ghana, and we feel like it's a great place for people to be able to discuss and be influenced and to be engaged around the things that we want young people to do. Talking about digital skills, we've also started getting into um, the training space, where this year we are actually training different people around the country who are going to go and train um, others in how to make their businesses more digital and also train on digital skills for jobs. Around um, this information and around the media space, I think when COVID you know, was emerging, there's a lot of fake news that was being shared, um, especially around how to treat COVID, et cetera. So one thing that we've become very interested in is in our WhatsApp groups and in places where Ghana think members are, we try to fight a lot of fake news. So even just today, as I was here, someone sent a message about how to get a scholarship for McGill, <laughs> which is a fake message. So I just sent it to my McGill friend saying that, look, McGill is the means for coming. So in our communities, we are fighting fake news. If we see something that we think is fake or is disinformation, we point it out and we help people understand how to also figure out what fake news is. And then, um, so this is something we are doing with an Aquale project. And uh, coming to the um, before I come to the Ghanaian dream thing, one of the key things that we realized since we started Ghana um, bar camps at least in 2008 is there are lots of young people in Ghana who are influential in their spaces. So we want to be able to reach most people in Ghana through these young people. So even though we might have a bar camp in Tamale and we might not have it in Yendi or Damango, there are people who have NGOs that do space in this work, uh, who do um, work in these spaces, who can come to bar camps, be engaged, learn the right things, and then go and engage others. So there's a bit of a multiplier effect in what we are doing. And more recently, we've been trying to get more into a bit of advocacy and policy. We are gradually trying to get into that space, and we are doing that through a Ghanaian dream campaign, where we've basically asked um, Ghanaians or people who love Ghana, what is their Ghanaian dream? And we asked it in the sense of what is their dream for Ghana? What do they want to see in Ghana, right? If, um, like, what would they want to see to say that Ghana has arrived? Ghana is where we want it to be. And most of what we hear people saying uh, is that people want to see a Ghana that produces a lot of what we consume, number one. People want to see a Ghana that sy where systems work. Right? And you know, people don't have to go and bribe and you know, cut queues to be able to get things done. Lots of people also want to see a Ghana where people can be the best they can be in here in Ghana. So if I want to go to the moon, I can go to the moon from Ghana. And, and then I think a lot of people also want to see, um, especially things around maybe agric health, see bigger companies that are run by Ghanaians in Ghana. So since, because we started this campaign a while ago, and this is what a lot of young people want, or people want to see about Ghana. Yeah. I think we've come rather full circle to, to how we started today's program, right? With the speeches that started in the morning about essentially the Ghana, the kind of Ghana that we want, and, and young people from Ghana are saying the same things that the chief mentioned, um, that the professor mentioned, mentioned as well, like envisioning the, the future that we want um, and, and being active participants in that. Ghanaian citizens want to have a role in the future that they build. Um, we've, you know, it's a lot of people on the panel, we've said a lot of different things, um, but we have a, a few people in the room that have stayed with us through the somewhat chaotic <laughs> panel that's come together. So I want to give people in the room a chance to contribute to the conversation. Uh, you know, if you have a question for any member of the panel, from the academic researchers to practitioners, um, we want to invite you to, to share comments or questions so um, you have that opportunity as well. So if you, if you just let me know by hand and, and we'll 
you know, give you the bite uh, and, and bring you in. Yes. So while, while you think about the question that you want, I'll let um, Wisdom uh, sort of go back to, to some of the, the things that we did. Uh, so just a couple of points to tie this uh, together, because say, I mean, we're talking about, it might seem like these are disparate conversations, but indeed they are, you know, because I started off talking about media convergence, right? And, and the, the fact that we're now in this knowledge economy where you cannot but be engaged with these technologies and how they shape things. But there are a number of issues that have come up that I think are important to, to foreground, um, because we tend to be focus on the technology and what we can do. There's a setting, you know, utopian view of technology and what they are able to do. And going to your point about what the critical scholars are looking at, there are fundamental questions in our research uh, that people have access to all these platforms. And, and uh, to, uh, when you were talking about uh, misinformation and disinformation in those spaces, those are critical things to bear in mind. The fact that we have access to information, a lot of people are engaged, does not necessarily mean the quality of our polity uh, is enhanced. And, and for some of us, that is very critical uh, because what you see is uh, even on these platforms, as you have multiple spaces, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or whatever it is, you're seeing amplification of the same narratives. Um, and so just this past weekend, we had the NPP Congress and you see that there's a sense of insularity where people seem to be oblivious to what is happening outside of their own bubble. And, and how do we break those bubbles so that people are able to see that you know, uh, message about McGill and are, you know, sophisticated enough, uh, they're, they're illiterate enough in this digital spaces to be able to siphon what is right and what is not, right? And I think those are the things where we conflate access to these things and play in these spaces with the quality of our political systems. And, and for those of us who are political scientists, this is important because I see a lot of people on these technologies and they're not politically astute. They're not able to tell the difference between misinformation, disinformation, and so on. And that is what is absolutely critical to the kind of space we want to be. So um, Raymond was talking earlier today about you know, the constitutional reforms that need to happen. There are a lot of people who are very steeped in the extant ways of doing things because we're not opening ourselves up to these things. And because Ghana has become so hyper-partisan, being able to be in the space that you folks are and saying, you know, um, because even the question you're asking about AI, we're so sold on AI and we don't address the critical issues about the ethics of it. People don't even understand that algorithms are themselves value laden. And how do those values shape what it is that you want? If, if you look at your search engines, what gets pushed forward yeah. is reflective of who is paying the higher price for some of these things. And so it's important that we, we don't lose sight of this as we celebrate these technologies. We need to bring a critical eye to them because that is in fact why we are in some cases not moving forward because we, we're content with the facade of it and not getting into kind of the deep things that you folks are raising, right? Questions around ethics, questions about inequality, questions about surveillance and how these technologies in fact um, are Janus face, right? They do these great things, but they've got these other pieces to it. So I just wanted to share those perspectives on the kinds of things that folks like Sarah and myself and Kwame do and, 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 and when, you know, we're talking about gendered pieces around this stuff, you know, really critical questions that we need to do and understand that this determinist notion of technology is not going to get us there. The folks who are selling us these technologies have built into those devices some dependencies what we haven't talked about here at all. And those dependencies, again, for me, going back to Raymond's point about the Constitution, we imbibe all these things hook, line, and sinker, and we don't situate it within our own context. So I just want to leave folks with those thoughts. A lot to put in there, but they're critical to how well we do. And when I talk about capture, when the government says to, you know, telcos, you know, because remember when we had COVID, the president said to protect you, I need to get all this information about what you're doing. And people were like, sure, you know, um, and then others were like, no, 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 no. It opens up to a surveillance economy that we don't want to have. So I think it's important that we keep throwing these things out there where something that seems quite mundane, something that seems not insidious, is in fact insidious in ways that can be far reaching. And as citizens, we need to be you know, critically minded to see the wheat from the chaff.
Thank you, Wisdom. Um, essentially, you, you're also highlighting the importance of different kinds of literacy, right? So there is civ civic literacy in the way that we, we, you know, comes from the political science work that you've been doing. There's digital uh, and, and media literacy, there's technological literacy, all of these things um, are important for um, I guess taking the the positive aspects of the technologies uh, rather than the negative, right? Because as you said, all of these things are Janus faced, uh, meaning they have a, a two sides, a, a negative and a positive side. And how we optimize these things for our for our own good really uh, is dependent on active citizenship at multiple levels, right? Um, in a way that, that yeah, again, building the Ghana that we we kind of envision, the Ghana that most of us want is is a positive and a good one. Um, I, will, I want to include Reginald in the conversation. We are at our time, but I, this is really important. Reginald um, uh, is the co-organizer of both panels, um, and it is through his efforts that the University of Wisconsin has been able to fund uh, some of our participants. Um, um, but his work is, is crucially important because uh, you know he's been studying the way that um, the diaspora uses technology, again, in, in sort of engaging with with Ghana and, and, and other parts of Africa. And so, um, Reginald, I, I, I would like for you to, to say a few words, if you can, um, as, we, as we round up the, the, the panel. Yes, you're, you're being beamed through a Bluetooth speaker, but I'm not sure that it's actually doing the job that we wanted to, so I'll put the mic next to it. Okay, well, I think, I think uh, thank you everyone for coming, and I apologize I can't be there. But, uh, you know, I think this, is, this panel discussion is part one, and uh, it was really fantastic. Every, all the views shared have really opened up possibilities, and I'm hoping that the exchange can be beneficial for everyone involved. And, of course, the challenges of making this a virtual. I'm coming from Madison, Wisconsin. I believe Alex is somewhere in Europe right now, and then Bernard is in Accra, you know, demonstrates the fragility and challenges of uh, the internet, but also I think the real possibilities. I think that's all I'll say. And you know, you can watch my video uh, of my lecture. The link is there. And I want to thank Saram and Fauzi for being troopers in really making this uh, this come off today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reginald, and thank you everyone for for joining us. And please help me thank all of our panelists. Um, all, who, all of who have traveled uh, really far to join us. And we appreciate you for also sticking with us again through the changes in the program. So a round of applause for everybody. Thank you. <laughs>